Okay, let's open our Bibles. As you can see on the screen behind me, today we'll be in Matthew 6, verses 16 through 18, where we will be talking about fasting. Let's read the words of our Lord Jesus Christ when he said in verse 16, whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full. But you, when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. This is God's holy, inspired, authoritative word of truth. All of God's people say, amen. Okay. Well, today, again, we will be concluding this section within Jesus' sermon, the Sermon on the Mount. This section that we started in verse 1 of chapter 6, and we'll, we'll tie it up today in verses 16 through 18. If you recall, uh, in this section, Jesus was warning his disciples about hypocrisy in religion. Remember in verse 1, he said to his disciples, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men, to be noticed by them. Again, Jesus was saying that you've got to be careful. In the area of religious works, again, he was not teaching uh, religious works to earn your salvation. We know that. He was talking to his disciples who were present on that sermon saying, Look, beware. When you're practicing your religious works, for instance, in giving, praying, or as we're going to learn today, fasting, Jesus said, do not be like the religious hypocrites, the Pharisees and scribes, right? Again, we know the re religious hypocrites were only doing their religious works. Why? To get the attention of others and to get the applause of others. They were not giving. They were not praying. They were not fasting to focus on God and to bring glory on God. They were doing it for themselves. And Jesus called them hypocrites, masked men. They looked religious on the outside, but their true motives, it was all about themselves, getting praises from others. And Jesus started this section by telling his disciples, be aware, be careful. And at the same time, he was telling all the non-believers who were present on that sermon, um, don't be impressed with all the religious works you, you think look so great from these Pharisees and scribes because they're hypocrites. And Jesus was teaching the non-believers that there was absolutely no way that they could be saved, no matter how many religious works they did, apart from Jesus and his saving grace. And so again, in our section here, verse 1, Jesus gave the warning, and then Jesus gave three examples. Example number one he showed the hypocritical way of giving. Remember the Pharisees and scribes trumpeting, blowing their own horns so they could be seen by men? That's verses 2 and 4. Jesus said that's the hypocritical way. And then he taught his disciples Christ's way of giving. You're doing it for the Father. So when you're giving, pretend no one is around. No one sees except your heavenly Father. And then in the area of praying, verses 5 through 15, Jesus again said, Do not be like the religious hypocrites. They're praying. They're out in the open. They want to be seen by people so they can get the applause of man. Jesus also warned his disciples, saying, Don't pray like the pagans and become like babbling fools, thinking somehow that's going to move God to answer your prayers. No. And remember, we've been studying over the last several weeks, Jesus said to his disciples, Pray in this way, our Father who art in heaven. And so again, this entire section, Jesus, after giving the warning about religious hypocrisy, gives the contrast. Don't be like the Pharisees and scribes, hypocrites in giving, praying, and fasting. This is how I, Christ said, expect you to give, pray, and fast. Make sense? 
And so today we're going to close this section uh, with Jesus' teaching on fasting. Again, the hypocritical way. And again, we're not going to have to, I'm not going to have to explain much about that because you already understand the hypocritical way. Why were they fasting? Same reason why they were giving and praying to be noticed by man, right? And then Jesus will give his way. Now, um, let's talk about fasting because there's a lot of confusion when it, when it comes to this idea of fasting. Um, what exactly is the biblical uh, definition of fasting? Now, in the strictest sense, fasting in the Bible, we see numerous examples of it, um, has to do with abstaining from food or drink, right? Again, food is a very basic human need, right? We need to eat. And the idea of Fasting in the strict, strictest sense is you're saying, you know what, I'm going to say no to this very important basic human need that I have, food and drink, because I want to show God that I need him more. That he's even more important to me at this point, as he always should be, than even food and drink. And so in the strictest sense, fasting has to do with abstinence from food or drink. And we see several examples of different types of fasts in that way. You see uh, a complete full day fast. You see partial fasts. You see total abstinence from food and drink, or you see partial abstinence. In fact, did you guys all know that last night you fasted? Yeah, while you slept. You didn't eat, did you? You didn't drink, did you? And when you woke up this morning, you broke your fast. How? Your first meal today? Breakfast. So you all fasted. But, was that Christ's way that he wants us to fast? And so the strictest sense, abstinence from food and drink. But scripture gives us numerous examples, kind of like a broader sense of fasting in the scriptures. And so I think the best definition of fasting is this one here. It is the denial of self and dependence on God. You're saying no to self, selfish desires, true needs for yourself, maybe food and water. Whatever it may be, you're denying self because you really want to and need to depend upon God. And again, that could include denial of food and drink. Doesn't necessarily have to. But you are seeking God. You are you know that you've got something in your life or some things in your life that maybe are getting in the way, getting in the way of a deeper, more focused, intimate relationship with God. And you're saying, God, I'm done with it. I, enough of this, enough of me. I need you. In fact, you see throughout the Old Testament this Hebrew expression that actually describes, in a broad sense, fasting. To humble yourselves before God. And again, I'll show you an example of that in a few moments, but as you go and read the Old Testament, you'll see that Hebrew expression used very often. And that expression literally is equivalent to fasting. 
again, you're denying self. You want to depend on God. Again, we always want to do that, but unfortunately, we don't always do that, right? And so, we again, we see several examples of that in Scripture. People humbling themselves before God as, as they're in deep sorrow. They're mourning. Maybe they're in deep sorrow because of some sins they've been struggling with. Sins that have actually have been having victory over them. And so, you see people humbling themselves before God. In deep sorrow, repentance, sackcloth, ashes, faces to the ground. In some of those cases, they're abstaining from food and drink. You know why? Because they're in such deep sorrow, they have no appetite. They have no desire. And you've been through that before, right? Where it's like, you don't even want to think of food. You're struggling with something. You're, you're dealing with some sort of guilt. You, 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 you keep stepping into, into sinful temptations and you know it's wrong and you're struggling and the guilt is killing you. And you get to the point where you say, enough, enough, denial of self, whatever it takes. If I have to take off five days of work and not even get paid for it, I'm going to deny self because I need to depend on God. I need victory over this. Again, if that includes putting away food and drink, whatever it may be, the internet, the television, the gym, whatever it is. God, enough of me. I need more of you. We see other examples in the scripture when people are looking for guidance. Again, Old Testament, uh, you know, uh, God's people were looking for guidance when an enemy army was coming against them. Very often we would see that they would humble themselves before the Lord. And there would be a fast. Again, sometimes it meant food and water. Other times it just meant, Lord, we need you. We need to focus on you. We need guidance. Other times we see they needed patience. Maybe they had some worry or fear about the future. God, we need your patience. We need patience from you, God. The ability to wait upon you. God, we need you. So whatever it takes when it comes to me, whatever I need to deny of me to be able to focus on you, worship you, draw closer to you so that I can get patience from you for whatever I'm worried about. We see all of this here in the scriptures and even more things where God's people are humbling themselves before God. They're fasting. And again, it often included abstinence from food and water. There were times it didn't. Sackcloth, ashes, faces to the ground, and so forth. Does that make sense? So, we don't want to limit fasting to just the strictest sense, food and water. We all should be fasting, right? And again, I know you all fasted last night when you were sleeping, but as we're going to learn today, that's not quite the biblical fast <laughs> that Jesus is talking about, right? Okay? Now, number two. Fasting is assumed in the New Testament, i.e., that God's people will do it. But watch me, it is not commanded in the New Testament. And I'll show you in a few minutes what I mean. It's assumed. I mean, again, look at our text for today, verse 16. How does Jesus start out the verse? Whenever you fast. Do you see how he assumes we're going to do so? And again, if he didn't assume we would be doing this, then he wouldn't give us, warn us against the hypocritical way of fasting, and then also give us his way he wants us to fast. Whenever you fast, verse 16, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. Look at verse 17, but talking to his disciples, when you fast, you see how it's assumed? 
anoint your head, wash your face so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who's in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Fasting is a good thing. Wouldn't you agree? Denial of self, dependence on God, humbling yourself before God, as maybe you're dealing with deep sorrow, you need guidance, you need patience. So fasting is assumed. In fact, just chapter 4, verse one, verses 1 and 2, we know our Lord fasted, right? After he had been baptized, we read verse 1, Jesus was led by the Spirit into the wilderness to be tempted by the devil. After Jesus had what? Fasted. 40 days and 40 nights. Imagine that. He then became hungry. You see our Lord's human nature right there. He was hungry, right? Our Lord fasted. But you know something? While our Lord was here on earth, you know his disciples did not? Yeah, yeah. Hop over to chapter 9 real quick. Look at verse 14. Then the disciples of John, John the Baptist, came to Jesus asking, Why do we and the Pharisees fast, but your disciples do not fast? You see that? Jesus said to them, The attendants, i.e. his disciples, of the bridegroom, i.e. Jesus, cannot mourn as long as the bridegroom is with them. Can they? But Jesus said, after he fulfilled his mission on earth, after he ascended to heaven, the days will come when the bridegroom is taken away from them, and then they will what? Fast. So again, fasting is assumed by our Lord, right? But again, let me say to you, in the New Testament, it is not commanded. In fact, in the Old Testament, fasting was commanded only one time on one day every year. That's it. And that day was the day of atonement. Let me show you what I mean. Go to Leviticus chapter 23. And I'll just highlight today just the idea of the Day of Atonement. If you want to read all the details about it, you can read it on your own, Leviticus chapter 16. But God's people, God had released them from bondage in Egypt, right? They're on the way to the Promised Land, and they took a stop. Where? Mount Sinai. And it was there that God was giving this young nation, the new nation, Israel, nation under God. God was giving to them various commands, how they were to live, various warnings, how they were to not act and live. And so God was giving them his standards. And we read here, God talks to them about the Day of Atonement. The Lord spoke to Moses saying, on exactly the 10th day, of the seventh month, Hebrew calendar, that's September, October. On that day is what? The day of atonement. It shall be a holy convocation for you, and you shall, underline those words, humble your souls. Hello, fast. and present an offering by fire to the Lord. You shall do no you shall not do any work on this same day. So not only fasting from food, but also fasting from work. You shall do not do any work on this same day 
for it is a day of atonement to make atonement on your behalf before the Lord your God attention. Please, let me just give you a little bit of a background, the day of atonement. Again, once a year, the high priest and only the high priest could enter into the Holy of Holies, the most holy area, okay, in the tabernacle or temple. You guys know the setup, right? You had the outer courtyard, the bronze altar. This is where the priest slaughtered animals, right? The priest then would go into the first inner part, which was called the holy area. That's, that's where you had the, um, the table of presence. That's the, the bread. You also had the lampstand. And you also had the altar of incense that was constantly lit. And the incense, symbolic of prayers, going up before the Lord. You also had a curtain, a veil, that separated the holy area from the most holy area, the Holy of Holies, where the ark was there, you had the mercy seat, you had the cherubim, and you had God's presence there. The most holy area. Nobody could enter that area except the high priest and only once a year, the Day of Atonement. That day was a national fast. Men, women, children where they humbled themselves before God. And they sought forgiveness from God. Think about it. New nation, young nation, receiving commands. Okay, you know that, unfortunately, <laughs> they were going to commit sins of commission, and even sins of omission. Sins of commission, committing that which they knew God didn't want them to do. Sins of omission, omitting to do that which they knew God wanted them to do. Well, how is this going to be taken care of? You had over 2 million people in the wilderness, right? The Messiah had not yet come. So God gave His people the nation of Israel the Day of Atonement. So the high priest, he would have a, a bull for a sin offering, ram for a burnt offering. He would start the process on that day. Everybody would gather. It was a national fast, men, women, and children. And so it was that day that God would atone, cover over, the sins of the priest and his family, of the people and their family, and even cleanse the tabernacle or temple. So the priest, he would slaughter, he would take the blood, and he would sprinkle it, let's say in the tabernacle, on the inside of the tabernacle, he would go behind the curtain, the most holy area, but he would not go without blood, which he would then sprinkle on the mercy seat. And he would also go with burnt coals and incense, symbolically praying for the people or for himself, for the nation, there in the most holy of our holies, right? Blood and incense. You'll see why that's important in a second. In addition to that, there were two goats. One goat would be slaughtered as the substitute in the place of the people, the priesthood, the nation. The other goat, the priest would lay his hands on the goat. That goat was called the scapegoat. 
he would lay his hands on the, on, on the scapegoat, symbolically transferring the sins of the nation to this goat. That goat would then be sent out to the wilderness symbolically showing how their sins were taken away for that year. Now we know that the blood of animals could not grant true eternal atonement. But why did God set up the Day of Atonement? He was pointing to Christ. Why do we see all those sacrifices in the Old Testament? Well, we know that animals, <laughs> you know, cannot, we cannot have forgiveness because of animal slaughter in our place. But this was all pointing to the once for all perfect and final sacrifice of Christ. And so God gave his people the day of atonement. Again, national fast, everybody humbled themselves before the Lord. The high priest could go into the most holy area, toning for his sins, the sins of the nation, and even cleansing the tabernacle. And we read how important this day was. Verse 29, God said, If there's any person who will not humble himself on this same day. Somebody chooses not to fast? He shall be cut off from his people. What does that mean? Killed. As for any person who does any work on this same day, God said, that person I will destroy from among his people. Oh, oh yeah, total fast. From work, from food, from everything. And everybody, men, women, and children, had to obey this command. You shall do no work at all. It shall be a perpetual statue throughout your generations and all your dwelling places. It is to be a Sabbath of complete rest to you. And here it is again. You shall humble your souls. Complete fast from everything. On the ninth of the month at evening, from evening until evening, you shall keep your Sabbath. Day of Atonement. And again, on your own, you can read Leviticus 16 to get um, all the details there. Now, who is this command given to? the nation of Israel, the nation under God. It was a theocracy. Why was it given? Well, one of the reasons, again, new nation, young nation, sins of commission, sins of omission. How was that going to be handled? Day of Atonement, where God symbolically covered their sins for a year. Assuming, of course, they obeyed the regulations for that day, the national fast. But God also gave that day, as I said earlier, as a clear picture of what Christ would do once for all. And that's why I go to Hebrews chapter 11. The writer of Hebrews says very clearly, about Christ our high priest. Hebrews 9, verse 11, when Christ appeared as a high priest, as opposed to all those human high priests throughout the Old Testament. But when Christ appeared as a high priest of the good things to come, he entered through the greater and more perfect tabernacle. Hello, the holy of holies in heaven, which was not made with hands, that is to say, not of this creation, like the earthly tabernacle or temple, which the human high priest entered into once a year in the most holy of holies. Christ, our high priest, entered through the Holy of holies, right? Heaven. And he did this, gang, verse 12, 
not like the earthly high priest who would enter with the blood of goats and calves, but Christ entered the Holy of Holies of heaven with his own blood. Because it was through the shedding of his blood, not the shedding of animal blood, the shedding of his blood, the perfect Lamb of God, that we have forgiveness of sins once for all time. He atoned for our sins once for all time. He entered the holy place once for all, having obtained eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the ashes of a heifer sprinkling those who have been defiled sanctify for the cleansing of the flesh, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal Spirit offered himself without blemish to God, cleanse your conscience from dead works to serve the living God. So, do we still celebrate the Day of Atonement? No. Actually, every day as a believer is your Day of Atonement, right? Do we still sacrifice? and Do we have to go through the Holy of... No! Now, it's very interesting. Remember I ta told you, High priest once a year would enter into the most holy area, right? Blood and incense, right? Burning coals, incense, symbolic of prayers. What about Christ our high priest? It says here that he entered into the heavenly holy of holies with blood, right? Hop over to chapter 7. What's he doing in heaven right now? Verse 25. He's able also to save forever those who draw near to God through him. Since... Christ always lives to what? Make intercession for us. You see the incense as well? He's constantly praying for us, praying us home. And what is he praying? To the Father. John 17, Michelle, he prays to the Father. Father, I want Michelle to be where I am right now. How great is that? And so again, the Day of Atonement in the Old Testament was a national Jewish holiday and a national fast was required to them on that day but Christ fulfilled the ceremonial law right once for all time again God was just pointing with all those sacrifices all those holidays all pointing to Christ and what he would do once for all time. That he, the perfect one of heaven, would come to this earth. Jesus, truly God, truly man, would fulfill all righteousness for us in our place and then would go to the cross. And as he hung there, God the Father, remember the high priest in the Old Testament? Lay his hands on the scapegoat symbolically transferring the sins of the nation to the scapegoat and then drive the scapegoat out of the wilderness, symbolically saying your sins have been taken away for a year? As Christ hung on the cross, the perfect Lamb of God, God the Father took our sins, placed them on Him. There was an exchange. Our sins were imputed to Him. He who knew no sin became sin for us. And then God's wrath was poured out on Him. Instead of on us, remember the other goat, the substitute who died in the place of the sinners? That's what happened. Christ died, but three days later, he rose in victory, overcoming sin and death for us. By the way, Christ, Hebrews 13 says he was crucified outside the camp. Where are your sins right now? Gone. Gone. And so Christ perfectly atoned for our sins once for all time. We're saved by grace alone, through faith alone, in Christ alone. That's why we don't offer animal sacrifices anymore. His sacrifice was accepted by God. It's not like Christ has to keep coming down every year and redo it. Or, as the Catholics do, every Mass and redo it. What? And so, those of us 
who have been saved by grace alone, through faith alone, and Christ alone. We are in God's family because of Christ's substitutionary sacrifice for us on our behalf. Our sins have been atoned for. They're gone in terms of that day of judgment. That's why I go to Colossians chapter 2. The Apostle Paul talking to Christians in that church in Colossae. Colossians chapter 2, verse 16. He said to them, Therefore, no one is to act as your what? Judge. Forcing you to do what? He, they're not to act as your judge in regard to what? Food or drink. Why aren't you fasting? Why aren't you fasting? It's commanded. Yeah, Old Testament, one time, Day of Atonement. To the nation of Israel. Paul says to these young believers, don't let anybody act as your judge in regard to food or drink or in regard to a festival. Renee, why aren't you celebrating the Day of Atonement every year? Or to a new moon or to a Sabbath day? Paul said, verse 17, those things in the Old Testament were a mere shadow of what was to come. They were pointing to Christ. But the substance belongs to Christ. And so that's why we teach fasting. It's assumed that we're going to fast. And again, every day we want to say no to self and yes to our Savior. But there are going to be times, Christian, when you're really struggling with some deep, deep sorrow. Maybe you're just entangled in some sin and you're not able to overcome it. Well, of course, you're going to say, okay, whatever I need to deny of self, I don't care how important it is to me. Lord, you're more important. If you're seeking guidance, if you're, you're looking for patience on something, it's assumed we're going to, but it's not commanded. And Paul says here, don't let anybody be your judge. Try to guilt you into having to fast. Make sense? Go to Matthew chapter 6, our text. So now that you have a, a clear foundation on biblical fasting, again, we know strictest sense, abstinence from food and drink, broader sense, denial of self-dependence on God. And that can manifest itself in many different ways as you look throughout scripture. Sackcloth, ashes, face to the ground, deep repentance over mourning and sorrow over sin. Seeking guidance from the Lord, patience from the Lord. And so, Jesus says in verse 16 to his disciples, whenever you fast, here's how you don't do it. You don't put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. Again, in this context, it would be with food, a food fast. Do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance. Why? So that they will be noticed by men when they're fasting. Um, <laughs> How many times was the nation of Israel required to fast? One, very good. What was that day called? The Day of Atonement. Just once a year, right? 
You know how many times the Pharisees fasted? You can, on your own, read Luke 18. Remember the Pharisees standing up in the temple bragging? God, I fast, ready, twice a year? No. Twice uh, every couple months? No. Remember what the Pharisees said? I fast twice a week. God, aren't you impressed with me? I fast twice a week. <laughs> now, why is it that the Pharisees fasted twice a week? You ready? Rabbinical tradition said, um, you remember how Moses twice had to go up Mount Sinai to receive the law from God? Remember, first time he went up? And remember what was happening when he was up there receiving the commandments from God? Moses' brother Aaron and the nation, they built a golden calf. And they committed idolatry, adultery, the whole thing. Moses came down, boom, slammed down the tablets. He had to go back up, right? Well, rabbinical tradition that the Pharisees followed, they said that the two days that Moses went up, it was a Monday and it was a Thursday. They say of the same week. So they said, that's why we're fasting twice a week. Moses went up on the mountain because Moses fasted up there, right? That's why we're fasting twice a week. And that's such a nice, like, spiritual reason for fasting twice a week. You want me to tell you the real reason? Monday and Thursday, busiest days in the marketplace. When everybody was scurrying to buy food, right? Monday, beginning of the week, you got to make sure you have enough food. Thursday, the week's coming to an end. You got to make sure you have enough food. So Mondays and Thursdays were like high traffic days in the marketplace. And so guess who would show up on Mondays and Thursdays every week? The scribes and the Pharisees. And how did they look? You know what they would do? They would put purposely put on old clothes. They would make sure their clothes were torn and soiled. They would have disheveled hair. It would be everywhere. They would cover themselves with dirt and ashes. They would even use makeup to make their faces look pale and sickly. And every Monday and every Thursday, when it was the busiest, the most people in the marketplace, here would come those poor, suffering, fasting Pharisees and scribes. All of a sudden, Valerie would go, whoa, look at them. Look at Danielle and Pam. Look how holy they are. Or an would go, what do you mean, Val? What do you mean they're looking? Old? Don't you see they're fasting? Or an would go to Val, how do you know? Val would go, look, look at their hair, look at their faces, look at their clothes. They're fasting. Verse 16, Jesus said to his disciples, whenever you fast, don't put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do. For they neglect their appearance. Why? So they can worship God? No. So it will be noticed by men that they're fasting. Jesus said, truly I say to you, the max they're going to get in their reward is maybe some people notice them but they're not going to get any applause from God. Why? 
we learned that fasting is assumed in the New Testament, right? Jesus fasted. He said his disciples would eventually, right? We know the Apostle Paul fasted, but we know it's not commanded. And so here Jesus, assuming we would fast, make sure that we understand why we fast and what it is. Ultimately, fasting is an act of reverent worship towards God. Just like giving, just like praying. It is not a hypocritical show to impress others. That's why I said uh, your fast last night while you were sleeping and dreaming and snoring and not focusing on God, is that a real biblical fast? No. But you know, it's interesting. Throughout history, we see different groups fasting. Did you know that there are pagan groups in history, pagan groups, who fasted regularly? Yeah, um, some of these groups actually believed that demons could enter their bodies through the food they ate. And as a result, whenever pagans would start to feel some sort of like, whatever, demonic oppression, they would abstain from food. They fasted. Can I ask you a question? Is that a biblical fast? No. Eastern religions. Oh, they're fasting all the time. But why? Well, they want to make sure their stomachs aren't full. They don't want to get groggy, tired. You know, what happens if you get with a full stomach? So we got to make sure our stomachs are really, really empty. Why? Because, man, I don't want anything to get in the way of me kind of being lifted up into the presence of God and getting all kinds of secret mystical knowledge from God. So Crescio, you and I are going to make sure our stomachs are empty. We're fasting. Is that a biblical fast? Over the last several years in evangelical churches in this country, have you ever heard of the Daniel diet or the Daniel fast? Jewish man, Daniel, taken into exile in Babylon and would not compromise to the culture in Babylon, including he would not uh, partake of the delicacies of Babylon. He did not want to be, he did, want, he did not want to become part of that culture. Well, God, you can just read the book of Daniel, gave Daniel all kinds of dreams and visions, prophecies. Uh, Daniel was eventually elevated to really, really high position in Babylon, as well as the next empire, the per Medo-Persian Empire. Well, listen, I gotta tell you guys something. Every January, what we're going to start doing as a church is we're going to do the Daniel diet. But it's, it's going to be great because look how Daniel was promoted. Look how Daniel became more popular. Look, we're going to do the Daniel diet because it's the beginning of the year. And this is going to be your year of favor, of promotion, of breakthrough. Just follow the Daniel diet. And oh, by the way, a little side note, John, you're gonna look great in the gym. You're gonna be ripped. You're gonna be in shape because one of the benefits of this diet is not only are you gonna possibly get promoted this year, but you're also gonna look shredded. 
Is that a biblical fast? Denial of self, why? Because you desperately need to depend on God. Because you're really struggling with some sin. You're not feeling peace about some decisions you've got to make pretty soon. You need God's guidance desperately. You're, you're, you're up at night. You're worried about some stuff in the future, some clouds that, that you see coming into your future, and you're worried and you need patience to not panic. You need patience to wait upon God and trust in God. You're denying self not to look better at the beach, not to copycat Daniel and think that boom, you're going to springboard and get this is your year of breakthrough promotion and prosperity. You see what happens? All of those things? Hypocritical way of fasting. Because it is not focused on God. It is not focused on worshiping and revering God. It is still focused on you. And Jesus said, you want to do it that way? The max reward you'll get is maybe applause from people. Maybe you may get whatever, but you will not get applause from God because you're not doing it for Him and for His glory, right? just like hypocritical way of giving, just like hypocritical way of praying. That's why Jesus said to his disciples, verse 17, but when you fast, anoint your head and wash your face. So that your fasting is not going to be noticed by people. Because you're not doing it to impress them. Look normal. because you're not interested in impressing people. You want intimate fellowship and dependence on your Father who is in secret. And your Father who sees what is done in secret, He'll reward you. Again, not talking about earning your salvation here. How will He reward you? Maybe. That sin that's been beating you down and causing you deep guilt and sorrow, maybe the reward from God because you are fasting to bring glory to God, maybe that reward is God gives you victory over that sin. Maybe God gives you peace. when it comes to certain decisions and the guidance you're desperately looking for. God providentially guides you exactly to the decision you need to make. Would you rather that reward or would you rather people to go, wow, look how, look how holy you are fasting? Maybe the reward from God is just that patience. Again, you've been feeling uneasy about certain things in the future. You know you've got some decisions that are coming up or some challenges or deadlines, whatever it may be. And God gives you that peace, that contentment. Wow. Would you rather that from God or applause from man? And so, as we conclude this section, verse 1, let's read it. Jesus said to his disciples, Beware of practicing your righteousness before men to be noticed by them. Otherwise, you have no reward with your Father who is in heaven. 
So when you give to the poor, do not sound a trumpet before you as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and in the streets, so that they may be honored by men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full. But when you give to the poor, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing, so that your giving will be in secret, and your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. When you pray, you're not to be like the hypocrites, for they love to stand and pray in the synagogues and on the street corners, so that they may be seen by men. Truly I say to you, they have the reward in full, but you... When you pray, go into your inner room, close your door, pray to your Father who is in secret, and your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you're praying, do not use meaningless repetition as the Gentiles, pagans do, for they suppose that they will be heard by their many words. So do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask Him. Pray then in this way. Our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we have also forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil for yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Whenever you fast, do not put on a gloomy face as the hypocrites do, for they neglect their appearance so that they will be noticed by men when they are fasting. Truly I say to you, they have their reward in full, but you, when you fast, anoint your head, wash your face, so that your fasting will not be noticed by men, but by your Father who is in secret. And your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Are there any things that, as of late, you feel maybe have been controlling you? Maybe even hindering you? from a deep, intimate, God-glorifying relationship that you know God wants and that you know you want? Do you have some stuff in your life? It doesn't have to just be food and, and water that you need to deny yourself of. Could it be internet? Could it be social media? Could it be the TV? Could it be work? Could it be the gym? Could it be Anything and everything in your personal life where self is finding gratification at the expense of your dependence upon God. Has you been feeling the guilt of some sin you've been wrestling with? Knowing that it's wrong? Yet you continue to find yourself stumbling into that sin or sins? Every time then you hear the word during the Lord's Day service or during the weekday teachings, you're just being crushed and convicted and it's killing you to the point of sorrow and mourning? Perhaps you need to fast. The Lord's way, not the hypocritical way. Are you feeling maybe some lack of peace and some maybe uneasiness about some decisions you need to be making right now in the present? Do you need guidance from the Lord? Are you afraid that the way things are looking right now, you may actually end up going through the wrong door? If you need guidance and you need peace, 
Maybe you need to fast. The Lord's way, not the hypocritical way. And finally, are you really worried about some things in your future? Do you need some patience? Some trust? Do you need your worry to be turned into worship? Maybe you need to fast. The Lord's way, not the hypocritical way. Maybe you can spend some time now with the Lord. Maybe you need to think about and talk about with Him some things in, of self that need to be denied so that more and more of you can depend on God.